for sure. Uh, this is the uh, foramen magnum. This is the brain stem right here. This is the, the medulla. And this is the spinal cord down here. And so the tonsils are supposed to be up here, but here they're kind of pushed below. This would be the foramen magnum. In some people it's normal. People who have a Chiari malformation, the tonsils can be low. It doesn't mean there's a problem or they can die or anything, but this is just a picture showing you what a tonsil or herniation. It's a sagittal view. It's a sagittal view. Uh, it's cutting down the middle. This right here is the cerebellum, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobes. This right here is corpus callosum. This white stuff right there is spinal fluid, and it's in the frontal horns, occipital horns. Uh, this right here is the artery, optic chiasm. This would be um, the vertebral artery. This is behind the nose, it's a turbinate. So, uh, tonsil herniation, again, um, depending on what's happening, uh, the patient can have a head tilt and, and they can say, you know, my neck starts hurting after the, the, the NLP, and then they stop breathing. Okay. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Um, management of elevated and pressure, uh, intracranial pressure. So, first of all, um, you know, when we talk about elevated ICP, we have to figure out first what, why they're elevated ICP. And here I'm talking a little bit more of trauma, but think about anything that can cause elevated ICP. Uh, for instance, uh, hydrocephalus can cause elevated ICP. Um, but trauma is the easiest one, and I've got more examples in trauma you can relate more because it's more of a mass occupying lesion. Because the elevated ICP can be caused from tumors, can be caused from pseudotumor cerebri. So, elevated ICP from trauma is the easiest to try to understand the mechanism. The first um, uh, is the elevated intracranial pressure from impact and blow. Um, and consider this also like a balsalva maneuver. Strain, pressure elevates, and then it comes back down. Then, what happens is the secondary injury is what happens after the, imp the, the, the trauma from edema, from hypoxia. All these things are the more important part of what's happening, not the initial blow. And, and I'm talking about, for instance, a baseball bat. Hit someone, causes the fracture, and, uh, and uh, let's talk about a child. A little baby gets hit, their skull is soft, their skull puffs back out. Okay, so that's the initial trauma, the impact. But then what happens later, the brain starts going into edema, starts getting edema, starts causing swelling. Um, and I like to use this simple box model here. If the elevated intracranial pressure is like using a uh, thick box, okay, a rigid box, and then the brain starts swelling, and it's full of brain tissue, spinal fluid, and blood. So you've got three things that are trying to fill up. Blood would be from just cerebral perfusion going to your brain. Spinal fluid, again, uh, circulating the brain, protecting the brain, and then brain tissue. But if any of these starts increasing, for instance, brain tissue, we'll talk about an example of a brain tumor. If a brain tumor starts growing and growing, it will start displacing blood and spinal fluid. But at the same time, there's no place for the box to open up and stretch, so what's happening to the brain is it starts squeezing. And so if no more blood can get up there, there's decreased blood flow. If no more CSF can be produced, the ventricles start collapsing. And if the tissue starts getting swollen, there's no way for it to go. It starts compressing itself, okay? Um, and again, uh, management of LA intracranial pressure. And the easiest example is, I always consider, every, every, even in, in, in a floor, see a patient, do your ABCs. See what's going on. You know, do your survey, primary, secondary survey. What's happening? Why did they press the button? Is the patient comatose, passed out? And we're talking about patient when they're calling you, the patient's unresponsive. You have to start everything. And uh, I'm saying everything. Why? Because how many patients have we had that sneak in things they're not supposed to, that they pass out, or you know their their oxygen got kinked, their IV something happened to it. You should have to go to look around the patient first and then focus on the patient. Look at the family members. What are they doing? Is the mother of the patient or something? <laughs> you have to kind of look around. <laughs> Airway patency and cervical spine control. Very important. The patient breathing, mouth open. Did they vomit? Did they aspirate? Did they have seizure? So you have to just see that. 
make sure that there's no foreign bodies that were eating their piece of chicken and they got stuck. Um, and then what do you need to do to protect the airway? Bag the patient, call the code, endotracheal intubation, or even a trach if it's possible. But it's try to, to figure out what's happening. It, and, and I left here neutral uh, positioning on the spine. Why? Because what if they fell in the bathroom? You have to make sure, even if a simple fall, someone, some old person can break their neck from a simple fall. So even if they're in the hospital, they can also have trauma in the floor. If they're in the emergency department, everybody gets uh, cervical spine precautions when they come in. But in the hospital, we forget that. Why? Because they were walkie-talkie, and now they slipped. Same thing, spine control. We have to make sure. And, and again, if someone falls and they say, my neck's fine, they're moving, it's okay. But if someone's not responsive, you consider them as a possible spine fracture. Breathing control. Again, you have to make sure that uh, the oxygen, uh, again, I see here sometimes uh, patients setting 90%, twist on the oxygen a little bit more. COPD ears, they'll need extra oxygen. If you do that, they stop breathing. They need to increase your respiratory drive. They need some CO2. That's the way they live. So it's important to figure out kind of what's happening. Pneumothorax. Uh, again, um, patients who had recent cardiac surgery, these people. Uh, people who have cardiac surgery, have chest to be moved, they can have a pneumothorax. Um, patients from trauma can have a pneumothorax. Anybody who had the trauma to the abdomen, even COPD ears can have a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, again, depending on what's happening. Um, and then we look at circulatory, the ABCs, airway, breathing, C, circulation. Hemorrhage control, are they bleeding? Check their pulse. <coughs> Again, see if they're actively bleeding. Trauma patients, everybody's like, oh, he's got a scalp laceration. They ignore it. You know how much you can bleed? You can bleed out from a scalp laceration. You have to pay attention to a scalp laceration. Patients don't die from intracranial hemorrhage and they bleed out in the, sc the skull. They bleed out onto the street, not inside the skull. There's not enough space in the skull, in the brain, because the brain can't be displaced so much, or someone can be hypotensive from um, uh, loss of blood, okay, then drink goes into, if anybody says, oh, you know, he's hypotensive, it's because of his skull hematoma. No, it's not. <coughs> he's bleeding somewhere else. Figure out what else is happening. Um, and then, again, um, your A, B, C, D, you know, you do your quick examination. Um, pupil, pupillary size, reactive. Um, patients talking, not talking, sternal rod, everything you need to do. The same thing, it's, if you get into the routine, you can never forget it, because that's, you, that's the way you always do it. Once you start saying, oh, I never checked this because it's not, that's when you forget things and pick up, don't pick up things. I always try to go, and again, I, I, I always did this, because I trained residents, and training someone in PAs who had uh, neurospecialty, and I trained nurses, it, it, if you go and you always keep your same routine, you will never forget something. If you go all over the place and say, okay, I checked it, the GCS, then I went to breathing, and, and you have to go to the things you need to do. Why? Yes, if the patient needs, a, you know, it's bleeding, get a tourniquet, but you have to follow your protocol. Follow always the, the way you examine people. Um, secondary survey. Um, here we talk about the patient's, for instance, strength, sensation, reflexes, cranial nerves. And last time we talked about basic exam, but for instance, how do we check someone who is in, in, a, in, a, in a gurney? You know, have the patient squeeze your hands. They can do biceps, triceps, deltoids. You know, you have them lift their legs off the bed. And then you can start challenging. Uh, and last time we talked about strength. How do we document strength? You know, motor strength is uh, 1 over 5, 2 over 5, 3 over 5, 5 over 5. You know, that's the way we document strength. But it really depends, especially in something like this, if there is any change. It's very important to know anything's changed. Is it better? Is it worse? Did something happen? Then cranial nerves and reflexes. Um, and I, 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 I put this CT there. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Radio death starts in radiology. <laughs> Never send a patient to CT scan um, that you're concerned about their mental exam. If you're, if you're concerned about anything, Take a cold car, take an ambu, you know, because what happens in CT, everybody runs out, waits for the CT scanner tech, press the button and everything, five, ten minutes pass, and then you hear beep, 
now you're in trouble. Were you prepared? You had to be prepared. Okay. So, and, and this is a large subdural. This is kind of a, a subacute, an older person. This, uh, you see, in, in, in CT, uh, the brain is gray, uh, this type of gray. The bone is bright, and blood is also bright, but this is like a subacute. This is a subdural that's been there collecting. This is darker there, so this is an old person with a subacute subdural. But you can see there's shift. This mm -hmm. is the midline. Mm -hmm. And then the ventricle on the right side is kind of pushed, but the left ventricle is displaced, and you can't even see it anymore. Mm -hmm. So this patient has subfalcine herniation. This is the fault, mm -hmm. and the brain tissue is full. Okay? Again, the CT scan is to show obvious things. If you're concerned, and, and I always say this to you, you're the ones who are transporting the patient, not the doctor who tells you to take this patient or anything. You're the ones who can say, no, I don't, I don't feel comfortable, the patient's not breathing, protecting the airway, we need to do something. And then they can reassess, if he's got a good GCS score, then you can say, I, I express my concerns, I'm concerned that this patient might decompensate, especially in MRI, that's where patients decompensate. So always, you know, communicate any concerns that you have. Yes. Just hold on one sec. No, we say it, oh. you're on. Oh no, keep going. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to do something. Like this. I I'll did. You were going to talk something. No. Um, so, <laughs> ICP monitoring. Um, once we do the, the quick assessment, we get the CT scan, then we have to figure out, does this patient need monitoring? Um, and why the CT is important, because then here I've got two points. A patient who comes in with a GCS score, of eight or less with an abnormal CT should get monitored. And this is the standard according to the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Every physician is different. Most neurosurgeons follow this. There are some neurosurgeons who don't. But this is the recommendation. And uh, I, I sent a link that had a little bit of information about you know, guidelines. Uh, it talks about guidelines, recommendations, and standards of care. They're, they're, they don't mention this about standard of care. This is one of the recommendations. Okay. Um, also, patients who have, they also recommend patients who have a normal CT scan, but with the GCS scale of eight or less. And, and they say three to ten, but think about it. Three can be dead, so it's yeah. uh, it's GCS of eight or less. And they also say with two of the following features: well, age over forty, low blood pressure or if you're trying to figure out what's happening with the patient, like for instance, unilateral motor posturing. And, and, and I will tell you, if it's unilateral posturing, check your GCS scale again. Because if you're already posturing, it doesn't say for one side it's a five, for the other one's a four, you know. It, so, but these are the recommendations they have talked about. In ICP monitoring, you have a couple options. You have ventriculostomy. Ventriculostomy is a, a catheter that's hollow, that you can measure pressure and you use a column of water so you can kind of measure. And uh, some people use column of water, some people use mercury. That's another topic we're going to talk in a different one. We're going to try and get the Codman rep to come over, go over the setting and all that stuff. That's what uh, the lady had said. Uh, we'll see. Um, the other one is a fiber optic catheter. And this fiber optic catheter, what it does is measures pressure. Um, which one's better? You know, I prefer a ventriculostomy catheter. Why? Because other than monitoring, you can treat. Ventriculostomy catheter, catheters, you can drain spinal fluid and you can relieve intracranial pressure. Fiber optic monitors, you can just measure, measure, monitor, measure and monitor and say, oops, something's wrong. So which one's better, a ventric? Well, not everybody can get a ventric. The CT scan, in this patient, you know, you don't see a ventricle on one side. Can I get it on the other side? Yeah, I can get it. But some people, you don't see a single ventricle. So not everybody can get a ventriculostomy cast. Some people can only get a, a monitor, and that's the best they can get. Um, again, the elevated pressure has been shown to be a prognostic implication of patient with severe brain injury. Um, normal ICP. Anybody know what normal ICP is? Less than 20, yeah. Um, Patients in the ICU, someone's doing wound care, ICP shoot up to 50. Right. What do we do? 
stopped doing the work. 